So we're here at the Arm Tech Cons 2011. So you had a keynote today, and uh, the launch was 64-bit Arm. So what is it going to be? Well, what we've announced is the 64-bit Arm architecture. It's the first time we've done 64-bit um, Arm V8, and. It's kind of been an inevitable development from where we've been. Um, if you look at systems as they grow in complexity, you require more main memory, and ultimately as you pass the four gigabyte boundary, um, you need to have 64 bits to be able to address that efficiently. So it's an inevitable thing. I mean, I talked about the development of mobile phones and the complexity and where they go, and ultimately I think um, to 64 bit applies to that smartphone appliance in maybe 10 years. Um, obviously it'll come to things like um, tablets before then, but the real drivers for that market today come from high performance networking, uh, high performance computing, um, HPC and the server marketplace and that's the kind of short term drivers. And we, what we did today was announce the architecture, um, it's not a product announcement as such because we know that um, we're building on our 32 bit infrastructure the architecture fully supports all of the existing world. But what we need to do is build the 64-bit ecosystem and that takes time. So we announced the architecture today, you know, maybe 2012 there's uh, ecosystem development, chips and things arriving 2013, 2014 and systems being deployed over that. So it's a long, it's a long time development, it's not, it's not a quick thing. Um, but we need to get that ecosystem out under development, so that's why we've done the announcement today. So people have been asking for 64-bit for a while, right? And is that because they want it in laptops and servers, or to replace kind of Intel, or why have people been asking for this? Well, I mean, people ask me, kind of like, when's I'm going to be in laptops, and I kind of shrug slightly because laptops. I, I'm not really that interested in laptops. Um, it's you know. It's a, small market, I'm not sure it's growing particularly, so I personally don't really have have much interest in that. Much more interested in um, tablets and tablets that may have keyboards um, because you know that's still kind of some of older folks are quite used to used to that as an input medium. Um, but they're kind of low power thin portable devices rather than things you lug around with fans and, uh, and, and poor battery life. So laptops in themselves, not really a driver. And, and, I, and I wonder actually how many people are really running 64-bit operating systems on their laptops. A few, but not many. There's not many systems out there that really, really need that. I think the interesting thing is servers. Um, and high-end networking appliances, and you know that's from base stations through to to, to, to server farms, um, and servers have become an energy constrained system. And I talked about the the Barcelona guys, and they're 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 thermally constrained, and it's a power budget that's measured in um, gigawatts. Right, but but it 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 it, 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 it sorry megawatts, it, but they're they're constrained. It's completely different numbers than we're used to talking to. But it's thermally constrained systems, and what this isn't about is, or what isn't simply about, in designing better, smaller microprocessors that are high performance, low power. It's about building better systems. And if you look at um, what our partners are doing, they're saying. Take a server rack, and um, you've got blades with multiple cores in it, and on top of those blades, you've maybe got more blades that are doing the routing, switching, and network interconnect. Why does the architecture look like that? Why is there this big separation between all the components? And part of it is because if you focus on big processors, you have big processors with North Bridge, South Bridge chips around it, and that's the architecture you end up with. Actually, what if you look at it from a kind of SOC perspective, if you came at it from, from designing smartphones, you'd say, well, actually, I want to integrate part of that switch and network fabric into my chip so I can have an SOC that mixes all of those components that I then step and repeat and have multiple blades out of. And if you re-architect that system, you can actually get factor 10 difference in what the power is for a rack. If you just focus on the processor, you'll come up with the wrong answer. And part of our business model is about enabling our partners to do innovation in system design using our 64-bit technology or using our 32-bit technology and bringing their innovations to it to radically change what the system's about. 
And I think that's the interesting opportunity. And different markets, different types of servers will have different SOCs to address it. It isn't one size fit, fits all. And I think you know, there is a class of applications that maybe requires single core performance. Well, that's great. But if you look at where the volume is, the volume and growth is in the kind of hosting complex websites, doing search, all of those things which are about providing service to um, thousands or tens of thousands of simultaneous streams and replicating that. You've already got a problem that is scalable. And so do you maybe have a few more CPUs that are slightly less performant but significantly um, less consuming of power? You can actually build much more efficient systems. So that's the kind of vision of what I see happening in, in, in the server marketplace. And for those big systems, ultimately you need 64-bit solutions. So that, that's why we've done it. So you customizing ARM chips specifically for servers. It's not just taking exactly the same chip as in a smartphone and putting it in a server. Well, we're, we're designing the, 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 the architecture and the CPU cores. It's our semiconductor partners who are actually doing that customization. And yes, some of them are building chips that look nothing like a chip that you would put into a smartphone. They're, being, they're building chips that are designed to tile, to produce arrays of processors with the networking and switching built into that, um, which you'd never put into a phone, because in a phone you only have one of those chips. And so a lot of the complexity in that chip is about all the scalability and the interconnect. So they're completely new designs. It's not just reuse a smartphone design. You can do that. You can take a smartphone design and say, well, I can make it look more like a traditional server chip. But I think that benefits from the advantage of the power efficiency of the ARM architecture and implementations, but you lose some of the opportunity to look at a system and go, how do I innovate in that system architecture? So how powerful does a smartphone need to be? Um, a little bit more than whatever you have today. Um, I, I think um, when I talked about um, smartphone in 2020 and augmented reality, there are some, as I showed, some absolutely stunning augmented reality apps that exist today, but they're nothing compared to what you can see in a lab using a server farm to do it. Um, and adding some of that realism and that sophistication and auto recognition requires kind of what is today server class performance. You can't do that in the phone. You know, in 2020, some of that performance will be available in your phone. And I think when it's there, people will find uses for it. And it's like anything, the hardware enables a software platform and a lot of the innovation, differentiation and ingenuity is expressed in the software that gets written on it. But until you have those platforms out there, you don't realize what it is that can be done. But whatever you put out there, people will find a way of using it and want just a little bit more. So do you think the ARM Cortex-A7 will be the most popular uh, ARM Cortex processor, uh, Cortex-A processor? Um, I, I, I think they're all successful in different ways. If you look at our Cortex roadmap, um, we have a family of cores that scale from <coughs> pardon me, um, low performance to high performance. Uh, and you know, A7 um, comes in, in, in the mid-range there, where traditionally there is higher volume. Um, so those mid-range phones sh ship, ship in higher volume. A lot of people pay attention to the high end because they like the kind of the, the top right, the, the, the newest, the brightest and the best. But in terms of volume, yeah, a lot of that volume will come in the mid-range. So the A15 is going to be much more powerful than the A7? Correct. But they're compatible? Yeah, they all run the same software, so you could run the same software, you do run the same software or, or, on any of the Cortex family. Um, the difference is um, if you want higher performance, you have to spend more transistors to achieve that, and the A15 is larger, more complex, and runs faster, but it runs the same software as the rest of the Cortex family. So how do you design the ARM processors uh, now compared to in the beginning? Well, in the beginning, um, there weren't very many of us, and it was a fairly simple thing. We, kept, we had to keep it simple. We were simple guys and a small design team. Um, but we still had a lot of the characteristics that you see today uh, in ARM and its design. We had separation between people designing functional blocks and people verifying them. 
So there was independence between design and verification. Um, that was actually done between design and implementation, and that's how we managed those split. Today, there's a more complex split between design, implementation, and verification, but you still see those semi-formal processes to try and maintain that. It's just the design complexity has gone up exponentially. The number of people in the team has gone up significantly. Um, but yeah, it's still the same business. So how does it feel to be a CTO at uh, the ARM that does the processors for the whole world? Um, well, I, 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 having been with ARM from the beginning, it's kind of slowly changed year, year on year and um, it remains really fun and exciting. And, and I think that's one of the great things about working at ARM is um, we are at the heart of many different developments, whether it's on, I talk about, you know, cubic millimeter, tiny embedded systems, and at the same time, cubic kilometer, giant servers um, and high performance computing. And so being able to actually spread between that complete range of things and then in engaging in OEMs and service companies that build on top of those platforms. It's a great place to be. So do you feel you are basically influencing the whole world with the technology? Uh, I'd like to think that we are touching the whole world um, this afternoon. Uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, after me this morning we had um, speaker from the UN on global sustainability and pointing out that you know it's not what ARM does uh, in its contribution to, to, to carbon saving, it's what the electronics industry can do as a, he said, 2% consumer of, uh, of energy, how we can actually influence significantly the 98% that's being used elsewhere by providing smarter, more interconnected systems that actually can save energy uh, um, and carbon footprint across a whole range of technologies and industries that are only just touched by what we do um, in the electronics business. So you, if you have the right app on the smartphones and everybody has it, then you can save power all over the place. Well, I think it's a question of embedding intelligence into devices that currently don't, whether it's your light bulb, your light switch, um, your doors, the whole infrastructure of your building through to transport systems, how you manage energy distribution. It's about distributing that intelligence into the kind of infrastructure around us and everything that we do. So you're powering a smarter world? That's, that could be a good tagline. So is there a way to... Uh... Can we trust that you are always going to use the best technology that humans can come up with? And basically that's what our ecosystem is going to do, like you with the partners. Everybody wants it to succeed, right? So they will all contribute whatever they can in I, terms of making it best possible? I, I, I think um, it's not always a question of having the best technology. You've got to have the right technology. It's got to be good enough for the job. You hope it's the best. But actually getting it deployed and used is, is, is what matters. And sometimes you mustn't focus on, do I spend too much time polishing it versus, yep, that's, that's good, appropriate technology for the job, get it deployed. So how much do the partners, ARM partners, contribute in, let's say, the designs, the future designs? How, how big part is within ARM and how much comes from elsewhere and who well, if you, if, the IP of, of all of it? Well, if you look at the, if you look at a chip, um, smartphone chip, um, you know, the, the, the CPU may be 20% of that core. So that's IP that maybe has come from ARM. Um, the rest of it is IP that's been developed by the chip company. They do that, they own it, they control it. They make a significant difference between that chip and the next chip. Same ARM processor, completely different view on the system architecture. So that's what they do, that's how they differentiate. And because of that, that's where you have so much innovation in the ARM ecosystem, because there are lots of different people doing their 80%, it makes a significant difference. And it's not just controlled by one company. So I think, I think that's a critical thing, in, is our partners enabling and, and driving innovation themselves. Is it easy for you and your partners to work in the same building and share everything or do you still have the companies still have to be secretive and make their own patents here and there and then they only share parts of it and well people yeah I mean any business today is um, cognizant of IP ownership and who owns what and controlling that but we have partners come on site to do early bring up and we work with them and we've established over over years how you manage those relationships to make sure that when it's appropriate you put engineers together so they can do the right thing. Uh, are you surprised uh, how successful ARM is? 
To be honest, yes. I mean, if I go back to, to, to you know, 1983 when we started work on the first ARM technology through to 1990 when we spun out the company as a separate company, did I dream that we'd be here today? No. We'd be much more successful than I expected. Is there any risk that ARM can be too successful? And because ARM is a UK company, and that's, is that a good thing? Compared um, to like the US giants that are like $400 billion or how much they're worth, each of them? Well, I mean, we're headquartered in the UK, but most of our staff aren't in the UK. So we've got more people outside of the UK than inside the UK. I mean, for us, I think in the early days it was very good because it meant we spent as much time uh, in the first, very first few years in Japan as we did in America. Uh, and you know, there was very little European business. Uh, the business was always in the Far East and in America. And I think that enabled us to build what was an international company with partners around the world. And our business model is about enabling other people and building a global business based on their innovation. So being somewhere small, I, I think so it's compatible with that. Um, we don't need to do everything and be the biggest. Um, I think we're well positioned to enable our partnership to do that. Because Silicon Valley has uh, Google, Apple, all these very huge successful companies in Europe. It's hard to find uh, successful IT companies. Yeah, which is, we, 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 but, but, I, 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 but I think we've managed to do that by taking a world view and not just saying, well, this is the region we're in, we need to be successful in this region. We just take a world view. Cool. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you.